Greetings, and welcome to this episode in the series of videos on LiDAR with ArcGIS Pro. This series is brought to you by AmericaView, in partnership with the College of Natural Resources and Environment at Virginia Tech, the Virginia Cooperative Extension, and GeoTED UAS. I'm Cherie Auckland, and I'll be your guide. Chapters 18 through 21 explain the processes for classifying points in a point cloud. In this chapter, we demonstrate the process of creating a digital elevation model and a digital surface model, and provide examples of the settings used in creating them. We'll also review additional raster operations using LiDAR data. A digital elevation model, or DEM, known as the bare earth model, is the elevation of the surface of the earth with nothing on it. A digital surface model is a raster rendering of the first returns of LiDAR data. Recall from earlier chapters that a first return can be bare earth, the top of a building, or the top leaf on a tree, for example. When creating a digital elevation model from LiDAR points, all ground points must be classified first because only ground points are used. We begin with a new map scene and have added the San Luis Valley dataset. Be sure to display ground points only. A DEM is a raster dataset. To create a DEM from a LiDAR dataset, we use a conversion tool. To locate this tool, you can either go to the Analysis tab, Tools, and search for Last Dataset to Raster, as shown here, or you can use the shortcut icon in the Last Dataset layer, Data, Export drop-down, Raster which also opens the last dataset to raster tool. As we pointed out in previous chapters, you need to be careful with the shortcuts. They sometimes don't operate the same as the tools in the toolbox. We'll talk about that more in this video. The San Luis Valley last dataset already appears in the input last dataset field. But the dataset doesn't have to be in the project. If it's not, use the file folder at the end of the line to navigate to the folder where the last dataset you need is located. For the output raster, name the new file. Be sure to name it something meaningful to help identify it in the future. For example, I'm naming mine San Luis 10 DEM for 10 meter DEM. The value field is elevation. For output data type, use floating points since elevation values are not always integers. And use cell size for the sampling type. Sampling value is the resolution of the cells in the new raster. Leave this as 10 for now. Recall that the unit of measurement for this dataset is meters, so the resolution of the new raster will be 10 meters. Leave the Z factor as 1. If this is changed, the vertical differences will be exaggerated. Only change this value if you're creating a dataset for display purposes and exaggeration of vertical differences is useful. Always use 1 when creating a DEM for analysis. Interpolation type has three options, binning, average, and linear. The choice of settings for these three depends on many factors. For example, a different method may be chosen for delineating a watershed for a forested area as opposed to a watershed in an urban area. Consult the appropriate academic literature for assistance with making this decision. For this example, I'm going to leave the default values for all fields and run the tool. The new DEM is added to the 2D layers and contents and displays in stretched symbology, but it's under the point cloud. So let's turn the last data set off and change the elevation symbology to elevation number four. Now let's run the tool again but use natural neighbor as the void fill method. We'll again change the symbology to elevation number four. There is very little difference between the two DEMs just from changing this one setting to nearest neighbor. Let's create a 1 meter resolution DEM. The point cloud itself has less than a 1 meter point density, so we should see a difference in the resulting DEM. Change the sampling value to 1 for 1 meter resolution and leave the defaults for all other values. And run the tool. Changing the symbology to the same as the others, 
we see the range of values for the resulting DEM is slightly different from the prior two DEMs. Let's zoom in to this area. The greatest difference when creating a DEM from LiDAR data is the resolution. Comparing the 1 meter DEM to either of the 10 meter DEMs, so let me turn off the 1 meter, let's see what the one underneath looks like. It's much more pixelated. The finer resolution at 1 meter has produced more distinct features. I'm going to turn it back on so you can see those distinct features. In prior chapters, we've been able to use the swipe tool for raster layers so that we could swipe between them to compare them, but that tool isn't available in a scene. Whether to create a 10 meter or a 1 meter DEM depends on the purpose of the DEM, but also on the point density. The ability to acquire LiDAR at greater pulse densities, meaning more pulses per unit area or less ground distance between pulses, allows for finer resolution DEMs. Let's run that tool once more using triangulation as the interpolation type and a one meter sampling value. And go ahead and run the tool. Let's zoom further into the lake. The main difference appears to be in interpolation across missing values. So turning off the triangulation 1 DEM, we can see the differences. Now let's prepare to create a digital surface model. Notice that I have turned off all of the DEM layers and I've collapsed the symbology, and I've turned the San Luis Valley last dataset back on. The first thing we need to do is set the last filter to first returns. The classification code doesn't matter, it's still just ground here, but the tool will only use first returns no matter what class code the point is assigned. Now in the last data set to raster tool, I have the last data set as our input last data set. I've given the output raster a, a meaningful name, and I'm gonna leave all these settings default except for the sampling value, I'm gonna set that to one. And run the tool. The results are much different from the raster generated for the digital elevation model. Buildings are also showing, as you can see here. You can see the difference between the 1 meter DEM and the 1 meter DSM. Which to use, DEM versus DSM, depends on the project. For example, if delineating a watershed, a DEM is used because first returns from a building top or treetop are not appropriate for a watershed. Refer to academic literature for the appropriate uses for each type of raster. Now using a DEM created from the LiDAR data, other data sets can be constructed. Among them, an aspect, hillshade, and slope. Let's search for the slope spatial analyst tool. And let's use the 1 meter DEM to create a slope. We'll accept the default name and we'll use percent rise as the output measurement and run the tool. Slope can also be created directly from the last data set using the shortcut icon under last data set layer, data, surface derivatives, slope. and run the tool. You can see here that it's going to take quite some time for this to finish because it's generating millions of polygons. This tool creates a vector polygon feature class, not a raster. Each polygon has a gray outline, so to view the resulting polygons, you may have to change the outline to none in Symbology. Except for the number of classes and the color, the slope values are the same. Aspect can be created from a DEM using spatial analyst tools or directly from the last data set under 3D analyst tools, or using the shortcut icon under last data set layer, data, surface derivatives. Let's start with the aspect spatial analyst tool.
The input raster is the 1 meter DEM. We'll accept the default output raster name and use the default planar setting. The results are similar to the aspect symbology completed in Chapter 16. But what is the difference? We used a tool in Chapter 16 that was symbology only. No new dataset was created, thus it could not be an input to another geoprocessing operation. The dataset created here can be used to complete a watershed delineation, for example. Now let's search for the Surface Aspect 3D Analyst tool. Before we begin, let's make sure to set the last filter for our last dataset to ground points. The input surface is our last dataset. We'll give the output feature class a meaningful name. You also see here an input for class breaks table. Without a class breaks table, normal definitions for aspect values, or the range of azimuthal degrees that correspond to a cardinal direction, are assigned. A class breaks table might be necessary when more specific delineations of aspect are required, such as north-northeast or west-southwest, in addition to the standard. We won't use a class breaks table in this chapter. Go ahead and run the tool. Like the slope tool, because the tool is processing all points classified as ground, about 14 million of them, it takes a bit long to execute. The surface aspect tool creates a polygon feature class. Opening the attribute table, we see over 12 million polygons were created, thus the reason for the lengthy processing time. The processing time for the surface aspect tool was lengthy, but the process for the spatial analyst aspect tool required just two steps. One resulted in a feature class, the other a raster. The best option to choose depends on the project needs. Now that new rasters have been created, there are other products that you can create from them. We won't cover these in this chapter. The final two chapters cover surface constraints, what they are, how to set them, and how to use them.